To truly understand how flexible Minecraft's gameplay is, let me ask you this. Is it possible to progress in the game and beat Minecraft's boss mobs without mining or crafting? This was a question I asked myself a while back and set out to determine. And while there's a small asterisk due to the fact that one item is specifically necessary to enter the game's end dimension and must be crafted, other than that, the answer is yes. Now, don't worry, this isn't a bait and switch, there's a point to this story. You see, when I succeeded, I didn't chalk it up to raw skill. I'm a veteran player, but I'm no speedrunner or pro PvPer. No, my success had to do with knowledge and tactics. Which probably explains why I eventually decided to create Caves Notes. But the true takeaway is that a significant part of those tactics was villager trading. Minecraft is a game with nearly unlimited possibility. It's about as open world as you can get. Explore, fight, gather, create. You can do whatever you choose to set your mind to. But the same things that make Minecraft great may also make it overwhelming, especially for newer players. And that's why this video exists. I can't tell you how to play, but I can help you discover what you can do to get you started and for some more experienced players, maybe help you brush up on the basics. Welcome to Minecraft Caves Notes. Let's go ahead and mine right into today's topic. To gain a profession, an adult villager who's not a nitwit must be able to pathfind to a workstation or job block that hasn't already been claimed. This process happens during a villager's wander phase. One way to think of this process is that it's similar to Bluetooth pairing. In the case of workstations, this pairing is not complete until they can physically reach the block itself and stand next to it. As long as a villager has not made a trade with the player yet, their profession can be changed or reset by breaking the workstation they've claimed. When this happens, the villager will seek a new job block to attach to. By understanding this mechanic, you can break or place workstations as you see fit and determine what kind of trades are available in the village. Once a villager has gained a profession, they become interactable by clicking the Use button when targeting them. This will open a trade interface, which I'll talk about in a moment. Each villager that has a job will also have a job level, and can gain experience toward their next level by trading. Completing trades will award them with a certain amount of XP, which varies depending on the type of trade. In general, trades at the most recent unlocked level will award the highest XP, although there are a few specific trades that maintain a high value of reward even through the later tiers. The villager's level can be determined without interacting with them by looking for their level badge on their coat. This badge begins gray for the first level, which is novice, and then changes to bronze when they level up to apprentice. Gold signifies journeyman, emerald badges are expert villagers, and diamond badges are master level traders. Additionally, each trade completed will also award you with experience. Villager trading is actually a very viable way to gain levels towards enchanting or mending your gear. Once a villager has made a trade, their profession and potential trades become locked in. Breaking their workstation will disconnect them from it, but they will no longer seek just any other workstation. Instead, they will look for an unclaimed job block that matches their profession. If none exists, they will continue to wander during work time, and if traded with enough, will run out of available trades and be unable to restock. For this reason, if you do plan to guide your villagers to the trades you want, it is definitely recommended to separate them from each other and even shuttle them into some kind of trading stall in order to keep track of which villager has claimed which workstation. Trade locking occurs when a villager has reached its maximum available trades for a given item. Once this happens, they will need to restock by being adjacent to their workstation during work hours. Restocking can happen up to twice a day. Some trades are considered very desirable within the community, and resetting trades by breaking and replacing workstations is common gameplay. Bedrock Edition players have an advantage here, as trades one tier above the villager's level are visible, so players can make the decision to reset trades based on four trade options instead of just the first two. All trades can be divided into two basic categories, buying and selling. In Minecraft, emeralds may be crafted into decorative blocks, but otherwise, their sole purpose is to function as the game's currency. Giving a villager emeralds in exchange for an item is essentially a buy trade, 
while giving the villager items in order to receive emeralds would be a sell trade. Villagers offer two potential trades per level, which may be buy trades, sell trades, or one of each. Newly unlocked trades at higher levels do not overwrite previous ones, but instead expand the total options available. To trade with a villager, click the Use button to open their trade interface. Although these both look a little different between Java and Bedrock, the basic functions are the same. On the left portion of the interface, a list of potential trades will be shown. On the left side of each line, an item, an emerald, or a combination of both will be listed. These are the items the villager wishes to receive. Next to their desired items is an arrow pointing to the right and indicating the item they are willing to give you in exchange. If you don't recognize the items being offered or requested, you can hover over the item with your cursor to read its name. Selecting a trade line will attempt to place the villager's requested item or items into the trade input section in the upper right hand portion of the interface. And if you have the appropriate items in your inventory, this will succeed and the output slot will show an item you can take for the trade. Much like a crafting table or a furnace, just click on the output item and move it to your inventory, or quick move it, depending on your controls, to complete the trade. In Bedrock Edition, there is a trade button which will act as the quick move, and executing the normal quick move will actually trade for as many items as possible. If you do not have the items being asked for, the trade slots will be red in Bedrock Edition, and you will not be able to take anything from the output slot. Preview trades for the villagers next level will be in the list, but grayed out with a lock icon over them. In Java Edition, the trade lines will appear normal if you don't have the proper items, but nothing will happen when you click on them. If a villager runs out of an item and needs to restock, a red X will appear over the arrow in the trade line, indicating that that particular trade cannot be completed at the moment. In our previous video, we discussed player reputation and how it can affect trade prices. But there is also a second part to this mechanic, which is an individual supply and demand value for each working villager. Trading over and over with a villager for the same trade will eventually cause them to increase their prices. To avoid this, if you have a particular trade you want to make frequently, consider placing down several workstations to have multiple villagers available for the trade. One unique part of the trading mechanic is the wandering trader. The trader is not technically a villager, since he is not attached to any village, and will spawn and despawn independently. However, trading functions the same way, except all wandering trader trades will always be buy trades, and will be lines randomly chosen from a specific list, often at uh, higher prices than normal villager trades. Most players will not find the wandering trader to be very useful, but he does fill a specific role. His trades are meant to include items that are biome specific or might require an enchanted tool to collect. So in the early game, they may not be easily accessible by other means. So let's get started on trading. I'll offer a quick rundown on each villager profession, what kinds of goods they offer, and what things might be worth selling to them. As with most things, what you choose to trade is entirely up to you, but when you're deciding, Consider what resources are quicker or easier for you to come by. In Minecraft, an item is considered renewable if there are actions you can take to create more of them without constantly having to search. For example, trees can be replanted, so all wood items are renewable. Fish can be pulled out of the sea as often as you like. And drops from random mob spawns will always be available. Meanwhile, an item like diamonds is non-renewable since they must either be mined or found in chests. Even though the world is enormous, there are still limitations, and the more you collect, the farther you would need to search for new diamonds. When selling, always focus on the items you know you can collect more of, and when buying, consider what might be difficult for you to find in other ways. A villager that claims a blast furnace will become an armorer. If you want to create your own blast furnace, you'll need a furnace, some iron ingots, and smooth stone. As you'd expect, armorers sell armor. To trade for emeralds, initially you'll need coal, which is technically renewable, but not as much so for an early player. Once the armorer gains enough experience, you can sell iron ingots for emeralds. Again, although this is not a great trade in the early game, you may choose to create an iron farm later on, at which point the iron trade becomes one of the more lucrative options for gaining emeralds. At the armorer's higher levels, 
They may offer bells and shields, and eventually sell enchanted diamond armor. The smoker is the butcher's workstation. A smoker is also created using a furnace, but with logs around it. The butcher buys and sells meat primarily, taking raw meat and offering cooked varieties. However, when leveled enough, a butcher may also offer to buy sweet berries from the player in exchange for emeralds. Sweet berries are quick growing crops that can be easily farmed if you choose to, and in fact are even possible to collect automatically by creating a special farm area with boxes inside. Cartography tables are created with wood planks and paper and allow the player to copy, scale, or lock maps. And of course, for a villager, they open the cartographer profession. To gain emeralds from a cartographer, you'll initially want paper, and later on you may sell glass panes. However, glass is not a renewable resource, and while paper is, as it is crafted using sugarcane, sugarcane is one of the slowest growing crops in the game, so this guy might not be your go-to for making sales. Once the cartographer levels up, he will offer some interesting maps that will allow you to find rare structures. My personal recommendation? Avoid the ocean monument map. You won't need it. Get in a boat over a large enough ocean and you'll find one pretty easily. But the other two maps are definitely worth it when you're ready to go for the combat challenges and the loot rewards of either the trial chambers or the woodland mansion. Brewing stands aren't able to be crafted without first having a specific mob drop from the nether dimension. So in the early game, you'll need to find a cleric or borrow a brewing stand from an existing village or igloo. Brewing itself is a complicated topic that I'll eventually put together a video on, but for now, let's focus on the cleric. This mystic or holy man will actually buy rotten flesh from you, so over time you can turn all those zombies you've defeated into money. They'll also buy gold at uh, the apprentice level, but gold isn't super easy to come by yet. As for their sales, while you won't likely need them very often, they do offer an interesting combination of deeper ores like lapis and redstone dust, as well as glowstone, which is normally found in the nether. They often also sell ender pearls, which are usually obtained by defeating endermen, so if you don't like fighting the creepy alienoids, you could opt to trade for their drops instead. Farmers work at a composter, which is made using wooden slabs. The composter does not have a user interface, but certain items like crops and seeds can be placed into one with the use button, and with enough deposits, the composter will eventually pop out a piece of bone meal. Bone meal will show up in some of our future topics, but for now, just think of it as magic fertilizer, which can enhance the growth of some organic things. As for the farmer, they always buy at least one type of the four primary crops, and they may sell bread. At later levels, melons or pumpkins may also be sold to them for emeralds, and at higher levels, you will have the option to buy other food, including golden carrots, which are considered one of the best foods you can carry. Fishermen work using barrels, which are crafted using just wood planks and slabs. Fishers will buy an interesting variety of things, which may include coal, string, fish, and even boats. But some of the fisher's trades are actually paying him emeralds to cook fish for you, which you could just do yourself. At the higher levels, you may be able to buy an enchanted fishing rod. But ultimately, unless you love fishing in Minecraft, you probably won't be interacting with the fishermen too much. Fletchers need a fletching table, which is crafted using planks and flint. To this day, the fletching table has no other use except for decoration, making it an oddity among job blocks. However, the Fletcher is one of the most sought-after villagers for many players, as his primary sell trade is often sticks, which are easy to collect in large quantities with a little bit of wood cutting. Additionally, unless you have found yourself a skeleton spawner, the Fletcher may also come in clutch by selling you arrows for your bow or crossbow, as well as offering enchanted bows or crossbows when leveled up. At the highest level, Fletchers may also sell you potion-tipped arrows, Though, whether or not the specific type is useful to you is a toss-up. Leather workers work at a cauldron, which is crafted with seven iron ingots in a U-shape. The cauldron can be filled with water, lava, or powdered snow, and has a few uses we'll discuss at another time. As you may have guessed, these villagers specialize in leather. They'll buy it off you, but although leather is renewable, 
it's not easy to farm large quantities in the early game. As for their sales, it's primarily pieces of leather armor, and while some of the later ones may look neat with different color combinations, you're likely to already have outgrown the protection of leather armor by the time you trade up a leather worker. This villager is another one you may not find very useful, other than getting saddles at his highest level. Librarians, on the other hand, are even more desired than the Fletcher to most players. Librarians work at a lectern, made with wood slabs and a bookcase. Librarians may buy paper like cartographers do, but unlike most villagers, the appeal of the librarian is not what you can give them for emeralds, but what they will sell to you. Librarians can offer a random enchanted book at multiple trade tiers, including level 1. Because of this, many Minecraft players choose to break and replace lecterns to manipulate trades until they find the enchantments they are looking for. And even on top of that, librarians sell name tags at their highest level, which can otherwise only be found as rare loot in certain chests around the world. The mason deals in things stone related. For a villager to become a mason, they'll need a stone cutter, which is stone and an iron ingot crafted together. Masons sell trades tend to be clay balls and stone varieties. But as they level up, they will offer less common blocks to the player, like colorful glazed terracotta and quartz varieties. Although these blocks can be found and made by the player, they are not nearly as plentiful as the stone type blocks, and they take more than one step to create. So trading for them this way may not be necessary, but it's definitely reasonable. Shepherds require a loom, crafted with planks and string. Shepherds will buy wool and may later offer to buy dye, but it's a matter of chance as to whether these trades are worth farming for emeralds. As an example, white wool and red dye are fairly easy to come by, but black wool or brown dye might require too much work or time to be worthwhile. Shepherds will sell wool-related items such as carpets, beds, banners, and paintings. In general, most of these are easy enough to make on your own that you won't need to trade for them. But if you've acquired your emeralds through other villagers and don't have much of your own wool to use, then they might be worth it for you. Toolsmiths focus on tools. To recruit a toolsmith, you'll need a smithing table, which takes wood planks and iron ingots. The toolsmith's initial trades will be stone tools, but will progress to enchanted diamond tools as they level up. For emeralds, trade coal or iron ingots just like with the armorer. Weaponsmiths sell swords and axes, and their block is a grindstone, which can be crafted using wood planks, sticks, and a stone slab. The weaponsmith will also take coal or iron ingots, but does not sell stone weapons, instead jumping right to iron axes and enchanted iron swords. At top tiers, enchanted diamond weapons will be available for purchase. Both toolsmiths and weaponsmiths may also sell bells, like the armorer does. And that's how you too can become rich in just 23 easy steps. <laughs> okay, just kidding. But as I'm sure you've gathered, understanding villager trading can open up a whole bunch of new possibilities for your gameplay, allowing you to get rid of excess items in exchange for currency, and then using that currency to get some things that may not be as simple for you. Imagine, for example, settling down and farming crops until one day you've earned yourself a full set of diamond weapons, armor, and tools. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I do want to start doing something a bit different this time, so after I say my goodbyes, I'll put up a list of upcoming topics. While I do generally work ahead a little bit, so when one video posts, the next one should already be queued up, I want to give you the opportunity to influence the order of the Caves Notes chapters. If any of these topics pique your interest, let me know in the comments. If there's a clear preference, I'll focus on the ones asked for to get them recorded sooner. As always, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.